Uh, my father was a veteran of the World War I. He was a cavalry officer. During the World War, he was stationed at uh, Fort Clark in Racketville, Texas. Basically rode up and down the uh, Mexican border uh, to prevent any unqualified people to cross over into, into the, our country. But it ended up doing mostly chasing Mexican bandits back across the border. Right at the end of, the, of World War I, uh, he had the option of being dis discharged completely or staying in the reserve, and he opted to stay in the reserve because he loved the military. And so he, uh, he, wanted, to, he wanted to stay in. But from there, he went to Oklahoma and my grandfather uh, worked for an oil company and he ended up being a drilling contractor and that means that he had drilling rigs uh, that he rented out to the uh, oil companies. Made a lot of money and moved to Ponca City and got into the Roaring Twenties lifestyle where they partied a lot and drank a lot and uh, had a great time. As a matter of fact, we were quite wealthy during that time. I don't remember much of it because I was only about three years old, but he uh, and mom had partied a lot. And one of the things that my mother told about uh, their partying one time was uh, that uh, they were at, uh, at a country club, and, uh, and when the party was over at the country club, one of the, one of the people there said, uh, why don't everybody come over to our house and we'll have scrambled eggs and, and uh, everything. So they all ran out and jumped in their cars and headed for, for uh, the, the house, the, the, these people's house. And so it was so weird that uh, sometimes the couples didn't end up in the same car to get over there. I mean, they couldn't find their mate or whatever. And sometimes uh, one mate would r arrive at the party a long time before the other one. And then, then they found out that they were having an affair with someone else. Or, and it was, it was, you know, pretty much uh, the roaring 20s. And so mom said, uh, your dad and I made a pact that uh, whenever the party moved from one place to another, we would always look, look the other one up and, and go together, just so there wouldn't be any question of, of infidelity. And also, uh, they had a polo team. And he, uh, of course, joined the polo team. And uh, I, the, only re the only thing I can remember about uh, his uh, uh, activities in, in, in the game of polo was he had the highest rate of, of uh, fouls of anybody. And I asked him why that was, and he said, well, I learned to play polo in the Army, and they played rough. <laughs> the lifestyle came to an abrupt end in 1929 when the, when the Depression hit. Dad got wiped out completely, and we left Ponca City with everything we owned in the back end of a Model A pickup and went down and lived on a farm with some old friends uh, until while well, he looked for a job. And it was, it was actually quite a while before he finally got a job. And uh, that job was in Tyler, Texas. So that was our first move into Texas. And uh, after that, we never left Texas. He stayed in the reserve. And so when World War II came along, they called him up and uh, sent him to Fort Sam Houston in San Antonio, Texas. He was stationed there primarily in the MPs, which is military police, uh, to uh, and he uh, was in charge of uh, prison camps. When he was stationed in uh, Fort Sam Houston, uh, he was in charge of a, a detention camp for displaced Japanese people. They weren't considered prisoners; they were just had just been relocated. And so when when they got settled in, he, caught, he asked them to send their leader over and he wanted to talk to him. And he came in 
And he said, now I realize that your diet is much different from ours. If you'll send somebody over and just give me a list, I'll see what I can do about finding them. And he, they brought him a long list of things and he called in several of the enlisted men and sent them all over San Antonio and, and neighboring cities to, uh, uh, to try to find as much as they, as they could. They loved him because he treated them like, like people instead of prisoners. After he uh, was transferred from Fort Sam Houston, he went to a, an Italian prisoner of war camp in New Mexico. I think most of, the, of those prisoners were in the Sicily campaign uh, over in Italy. Then from there, they sent him to uh, Louisiana and he was uh, in charge of a German prisoner of war camp. And, and they, uh, they had all been in the desert war and they were so happy to be in the United States because if they weren't there, they'd be on the Russian front. And finally, he was stationed at uh, Claremore, Oklahoma, as the commanding officer of the uh, Oklahoma Military Academy. And it was a cavalry school, so he was in hog heaven, you know, just being able to ride horses all, all he wanted to. In 1942, I graduated from high school and uh, then went up to the University of Texas and, and enrolled in the fall semester of 1942 in, in the University of Texas Engineering School. I went one year of uh, college there, and then in, in 1943, I turned 18 and went out to Bergstrom Field in Austin, Texas, and enlisted in the Army Air Corps. And from that point on, uh, I was basically in the military, but I hadn't actually been inducted yet. They were they held off on, on, on inducting me so they didn't have to pay me uh, for a, a couple of months. So I went back to school and, and took some courses in summer school. Then in, in uh, I think it was September of 42, we were inducted into the service. We were issued our uniforms. Come to think of it, I never saw my civvies again until October of 1945. During the war years, uh, starting really in about 1941, our country was n nothing like it is now. It was completely mobilized. Every single person in the country was involved in the war effort in one way or another. Most of the able-bodied men were in the military service, but even those who were not were in, involved in some way. All, all the factories, for instance, Ford Company, Chrysler Company, General Motors, none of those were making any cars anymore. Not a single car was made, I think, uh, from 1941 until after, after the war in, in probably 1945 or six. Everybody was involved in it. The women, many of them, went to work in these factories. It was easy for a woman to get involved as well. And if they did, did nothing else, they had a victory garden. Now, a victory garden was if you had any yard at all, you turned it into a garden. The other thing that was different about our life during that war was uh, rationing. Almost everything you can imagine was rationed. Uh, gasoline, of course, was. Uh, tires were rationed. Food, uh, butter, sugar, uh, almost any kind of meat, everything was rationed. And so when you wanted to go to the grocery store, you had to take your ration stamps with you. And when I went to the University of Texas, I had to take an, a fistful of, of uh, ration stamps to give to the cook at, a, at our fraternity house uh, so that she would have enough uh, ration stamps to feed all those guys. When I finally uh, got called up, my first station was at uh, Shepherd Field in uh, Wichita Falls, Texas. And that was basic, that was Army basic training. Uh, they, were, they were training us to be a soldier, just like any walking private in the service. Uh, the fact that it was in the Army Air Corps made no difference. 
We, we, were, we, we had bayonet practice. We had uh, physical training like you wouldn't believe. Uh, they tried to get us all in real good shape, you know. And so it was, uh, it was basic military training. They ta taught us to be soldiers. They taught us how to march, how to salute, and the whole thing. So uh, uh, it, was, it was a very strenuous but uh, rewarding experience because I suddenly found myself in better shape than I'd ever been in before, you know. So at the end of that, they loaded us up on a train from uh, Wichita Falls. We started north. Of course, we had no idea where we were going. They never told us where we were going. Only the leaders knew our, what our final destination would be. But uh, a strange thing happened on our, on our way. Uh, before we ever got out of Oklahoma, uh, we had a water stop. In those days, we, they had steam engines, and they had to stop every now and then and fill, fill their tanks with, with water. And uh, so we made a water stop at some little, little town in, in Oklahoma, and uh, we couldn't wait to wait to open the windows. You couldn't have the windows open while you were traveling because the smoke was just... Uh, would kill you. So we were so glad to get stopped and then open the, the windows. And I looked out the window and there stood my mother uh, on the platform with two pies in her hands. One was a chocolate pie and one was a banana pie. And she handed them to me. And of course, I didn't have them for about 30 seconds before the rest of the guys grabbed them, and, and I think I got about three bites of each one of them. My dad uh, and his old war, World War I buddies uh, were, were kind of a, a club, and they stayed in touch with each other and, and knew where everybody was working. And uh, one of his old buddies was in the transportation department, and, and so he was able to find out from him where our our train was going, going to end up, but Dad wouldn't tell me that because he was sworn to secrecy. But, uh, but he did know about this water stop, and that's why Mom was there with those pies. The next stop where we were able to get off the train was in Denver. So we were, uh, had gotten that far north, and uh, uh, we all headed for the nearest bar. When we got there, it was so crowded you couldn't move, and uh, we we couldn't get there. There were about eight of us in our group, and uh, you couldn't get up to the bar to to even get a beer, and uh, we were kind of frustrated. Except that one guy in our group uh, was uh, an ex football player for the University of Texas, named Wild Bill Kilman. And Wild Bill was just as tough as his name implies. And uh, he took as much, uh, much of that as he could. So he walked over and there was a, there was a captain, in the army captain, sitting at the bar on a stool and kind of holding forth and taking up all the room. And, and you couldn't get past him to get to the bar. So Kilman went over, reached down, and picked up the, the captain and his stool and picked him up and moved him out of the way and he said, now captain, you just sit right there and enjoy yourself while we go up. So we all got up to the bar and, and got a beer. We, we, we weren't able to stay there very long, but that captain never said another word. He, he didn't uh, argue a bit about being moved because Wild Bill put the fear of God in him. Always when I when we were traveling or wherever we were going, I tried to hang out with the, with the big tough guys. And the reason for that was I was only 120 pounds and uh, I was always the littlest guy in the, in the bunch. So I liked to be in, uh, buddies with the, with the big tough guys. And Wild Bill was one of, my, one of my best buddies. And I'm not sure exactly how many days it took us to get there but finally, one morning uh, in December uh, or late November, we uh, woke up in the morning in Pullman, Washington. 
and it was it had been snowing. There were icicles all over the place, and it was colder than um, you can imagine. And and uh, uh, we were dressed in in our summer uniforms. So the first thing they did was issue us winter uniforms so that we could uh, at least stay warm. And they had turned Washington State College. They had turned the, the men's dormitories into barracks, and we were stationed there in what they call College Training Detachment, CTD. And that meant that uh, we started learning uh, about the Air Force. Uh, aircraft recognition was one of the main courses we took, and they, what they would do, they would flash a silhouette of a plane up on a screen, and then you had to be able to identify that plane from its silhouette. We learned the Morse code, we learned meteorology, uh, all sorts of things about the weather, and, and we even had a little bit of flying time. Uh, they, had, they had civilian instructors in Piper Cubs, and they took us up and just showed us how to do certain things. So everybody got a taste of what it was like to be in the air. While we were at CTD in, in Pullman, Washington, uh, I spent, uh, Christmas and New Year's there of, ni in ni of 1943. And when at, on New Year's, we all wanted to celebrate, you know, and have a little something to drink. But there was only one guy in our group that was old enough to buy liquor. We were all in our, I was, I was 18, and, and, and most of the guys were about the same age. But we had one guy in there that was 22, and he was a country western guitar and banjo player and he was uh, he was a delight to have around because he played every night before we, before we went to bed he'd play his guitar and, and, and banjo when uh, it came time to uh, for somebody to go to town and buy some liquor we, we sent Hank Burnett in town because he was the only one old enough to, to uh, buy liquor he was gone for a while and finally came back in with two cases in, under his arm. And uh, we were rubbing our hands together saying, boy, that looks good. He said the problem was they were out of bourbon, scotch, gin, and vodka. And we said, well, what do you got? And he says, I got two cases of cream de menthe. <laughs> and if you can imagine getting drunk on cream to mint, and then waking up the next day, it was fierce. But uh, that's, that's what, you, you took what you got. Shortly after that, I think, uh, I think we were sent in January sometime uh, to Santa Ana, California. And there was a, it was a big Air Force base there, and uh, it was called uh, a classification base. And, and and the, what they did in, in, in the classification base was give, give, give all the candidates for the various jobs uh, tests of every kind, mathematical, physical, balance, uh, even, even uh, night vision tests and, and, and just a thousand different tests. And uh, from that, and how you scored on various things, they determined whether you were going to be a navigator or a pilot or a bombardier. Or if you didn't fit any of those categories, they would demote you and send you to gunnery school. And, and from there, uh, you, uh, you were, in the, you were, you were an, an enlisted man and not an officer. So everybody wanted to get cl classified one of the three. And the reason... Uh, I got uh, classified as a navigator was because uh, my math skills were at the level when, where uh, uh, they, feel, they feel like you can uh, learn the navigation trade if, if you had good math skills. And I, we cheated a little bit. Uh, one of the guys told me, he said, when you get to the math thing, if, uh, if you want to impress them, uh, I'm sure they're going to ask you what the what the square of 15 is, or and, and he gave me two or three numbers. So I memorized the the square of uh, 
uh, 15 and several other numbers. And, and, and while they were doing the test, uh, he said, okay, Parker, uh, what is the square of 15? I said, 225. He said, okay. <laughs> so they, uh, when the testing was all over, they uh, uh, qualified me as a navigator, a navigator trainee. And uh, from there, I was sent to uh, San Antonio, Texas, or a little town right outside of San Antonio named Hondo. And, and uh, this was a navigator school, and uh, we learned every form of navigation. Uh, pilotage, which means you just look at the ground and, and what, what you see on the ground tells you where you are. Uh, DR, which is dead reckoning, which is where you, you use all the compasses and everything to get your direction, and a drift meter to determine the, the wind velocity and direction. Uh, and so uh, without ever looking out of the airplane, you, you plot your course according to what you get from these readings. And the other thing, and the most difficult, was celestial navigation. And that's where you take a sextant or an octant and uh, uh, measure, uh, uh, the, 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 you, you get your, your uh, location from uh, taking fixes on the, the different stars. So we had to learn a lot of stars. We called them pointer stars. And uh, so that was by far the most difficult uh, navigation that we, we did. At the end of our training, in navigation school, uh, we had a, a checkout flight, and on on this flight, uh, you were the only navigator. In the, usually, they had three navigators in, in the plane when you were learning all the different things to do. But on your checkout di a, a flight, uh, you were only uh, the only navigator in there, and uh, you had a pilot and the navigator instructor. And uh, you, you started off from one point, and in, in this case, my checkout flight, we left from, uh, from Hondo, uh, and, the, and the starting point was uh, the bridge, uh, the uh, dam over Medina Lake, which is right next to our base. And from that point, uh, we flew up near San Angelo, a couple of hundred miles north, and, uh, and then flew what they call a, 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 an expanding square search. And the purpose of, of a square search was like, if you're looking for something out in the ocean and you know approximately where it is, but you don't know exactly, then a square search, you, you fly one leg in, in one direction and then take a next leg and go in another direction, but go a, a little farther so that when you came down and went in that direction, you'd go a little farther. So the, the, you, your flight was always extending out, and uh, that's what they call a square search. And then at the end of the square search, then you, uh, in this checkout flight, uh, you went back to uh, Hondo, and, uh, uh, and your end point was the dam over, Med over Medina Lake. About 10 minutes out from the final uh, destination, uh, you, you gave the pilot uh, his last uh, heading correction, if you had a heading correction, and the ETA, the estimated time of arrival, uh, that you would be there down to the second. And uh, so I gave him that information and then just sat there for 10 minutes waiting to see how I came out. And when the 10 minutes was up, and the exact time was there for my de destination, the uh, uh, navigator instructor said, Parker, look through, the, through your drift meter. And I looked through the drift meter, and uh, the dam at Medina Lake was going right into my crosshairs. So I had what they call a zero-zero mission, which meant that uh, had, had I been two miles short, it would have been, you know, uh, 
they, they would have a, a number description of how far you were off on the time you arrived and the, uh, the uh, direction you had given them. But mine was exactly on the money, and I was the only one in my class that flew what they call a zero-zero mission. I was pretty puffed up about it until we got in, in the, back to the base and my instructor uh, started going through all my charts and stuff that I had made all my notations on, headings and airspeed and everything like that. And uh, he found about eight or nine errors, but they were all compensating. <laughs> so by compensating errors, I'm, I flew the only zero, zero mission. I didn't get credit for it because I had all those mistakes, but I was still the only one that uh, had the zero zero mission. Then uh, we went through a ceremony where they where they promoted all of us to uh, second lieutenant uh, and a qualified navigator. My brother was also in the service. Uh, it was kind of funny during the war. One of the favorite songs of everybody was "I'll Be Home for Christmas." If only in my dreams, you know. And uh, I got to thinking, what, a, what would happen to me? Uh, I don't have a home. My dad was in the Army, being transferred all over the place. My brother was in, in the Army. And so uh, I didn't have a home to go back to. And I, just, I thought that was kind of a joke for me to sing that song. When we had finished our training in navigation school and were commissioned officers, they gave us, everyone, a questionnaire and basically gave us three choices. Uh, you could either uh, opt to go to the Pacific Theater uh, and be in some, some combat airplane, or you could go to the, to the uh, European Theater, uh, or you could, you could put that option down, or your request for it, or you could put down that you wanted to stay in the training command and be an instructor. Well, I don't know how many were in my class, but none of them put instructor down. All of us were second lieutenants. And uh, it, it really felt funny to have a 45-year-old sergeant saluting a 19-year-old uh, lieutenant, but that's just the way the service was. Then uh, we were sent to uh, Alexandria, Louisiana for what they call transition. And the transition was tran uh, making a transition from training planes to warplanes. And that's when uh, uh, I first met my crew and, and first uh, had, had the experience of being in a B-17. Our crew uh, was made up of, uh, of uh, 10 guys, the uh, pilot and, and co-pilot were the, were the two ones uh, that, that flew the airplane. Uh, there was the navigator and the bombardier. Now those are the only officers in the crew. And the navigator and bombardier normally would both be in the nose of the airplane because that's where the bomb site was. We had what they called the Norden bomb site, which was a highly secret device for dropping the bombs on one spot. The enlisted men on the crew well, they were all gunners, except for the radio man, uh, who, who had a little office right, by, right aft of the bomb bays. The one who was an engineer, and he helped the pilot and co-pilot with the uh, engines to make sure everything was operating properly. He spent a lot of his time standing b up between the, the, uh, bomb, uh, between the uh, pilot and co-pilot. Also, he manned the upper local... Uh, gun turret, which consisted of two 50 caliber machine guns. Then we had two waste gunners and, and two waste guns. They were not turrets. They were just single, single 50 caliber machine guns. And then going further back, we had a tail gunner. And then the last gunner was uh, a ball turret gunner. And he's the one that dropped down into the ball, ball turret below the airplane. The upper local turret also was, was geared to, to go 360 degrees, but it had, it had a cam on it 
so that when you were coming around uh, toward the back of the airplane, it would cam the guns up so that you didn't shoot your tail off. And occasionally, that cam didn't work, and it, was, it wasn't unusual to, to have somebody uh, shoot the tail off of their plane. And we, we flew uh, many hours uh, getting used to the airplane and getting used to each other. There were 10 of us, and we had all had our special skills, and we, we came to appreciate what the others were doing, and you always tried to do your best at what you were supposed to be doing so that they wouldn't be disappointed in, in your uh, capabilities. So uh, that was a very strenuous and uh, but, but interesting uh, period because we fell in love with the B-17. If you treated it right, it treated you right. When we finished uh, transition, we uh, were sent to Lincoln, Nebraska, and we picked up a brand new B-17G model uh, that had no armament on it. We were just going to ferry it over to, to the European theater, and I had to I had to swing the compasses, which which means I had to had to calibrate all the compasses. That's when we got our first overseas orders, which were secret. We were not allowed to open them until we left the continental United States. And as soon as we took off, uh, we, we, uh, we knew what our destination would be. But uh, our first stop was in uh, Bangor, Maine. We flew from, from Lincoln, Nebraska to Bangor, Maine and uh, got there uh, just after a, a huge snowstorm. And uh, it was 30 degrees below zero in, in Bangor at the time. Uh, so uh, we, had, we were weathered in for two or three days while we, before we made the next move. Uh, we then uh, were sent to uh, Goose Bay, Labrador and that's, that was the last time we would, we would be in the continental, in the continent of, of the American continent. And the day we left uh, to go to Greenland, uh, we uh, had a briefing. Uh, everybody was, learned what their job was going to be. And we had a special meeting of, of the navigators. There were, there were about 10 airplanes in our group that were being ferried over there, and we uh, had a uh, navigator's briefing, which included uh, their, uh, all they knew about the meteoro meteorology of the, of the flight, what, what your uh, altitude would be and what your uh, wind direction would be and so on and so forth. So they gave us what they called a metro wind, which was uh, in, in my case, was a, uh, a headwind, so that, that it was going to take us a little longer to get there because we were flying into a headwind. And while we were on, in the air, uh, after had been in the air several hours, uh, one of the crew members said, uh, Navigator, doesn't that look like land up there to you? And I said, nah, can't be. It's, it's too far away, we, we're no way. And a little while later, one, another one called and said, Navigator, that sure like, looks like it might be land to me. And I said, no, that's, that's just a cloud formation. And then, and then I looked down, and here was a, an ice flow floating right under us. And I said, uh-oh, that, that's not supposed to be here. When uh, I saw an ice flow that we could fly over, I, I had the pilot fly, fly directly over an ice flow so that I could get a ground speed by timing uh, through the drift meter. And the way you did that was uh, you have a, a crosshair on, on either end, and uh, when, when the plane goes over one crosshair, you time it till it gets to the other crosshair. And from that, you can, you can uh, make a calculation and determine your ground speed 
and since we knew what our airspeed was, you can figure your ground speed. And when I did, I said, this is weird. Uh, we're going much faster than, than uh, we had calculated. Well, it turned out that the, the guys who gave us the, the uh, metro wind gave it to us 180 degrees off. And so instead of a, of a headwind, we had a tailwind the whole time. Then the most exciting part of going into Greenland was that you had to go into a fjord to get back into our to the Air Force Base that we had back in there, which was right next to a big lake. But you couldn't see that from from uh, from the uh, south end of the, of the Greenland, and you had to find a certain fjord to go up. And when you got in that fjord, you started letting down. And pretty soon we were far enough below the, the, the uh, edges of, of that fjord that, that uh, there was no turning around. We had to stay in that wherever it took us. But I, I knew what to look for because they briefed us on what, what to look for. And uh, so I felt confident, but still it's kind of spooky because it looks like you're just flying up into a box canyon. And when you get, get, got closer and closer, to, we had a, a landmark called Sugarloaf Hill that uh, I spotted, and I was, I was pretty sure we're okay, but still it's a funny feeling, like you're just gonna fly into a wall, and then suddenly we go, go past uh, on, the, on the right side, and uh, it opens up, and, and all, we made a turn there, and then we were over that lake and then the end of the runway is, was on the other end of the lake. We had about a four day stay there before we went on to our next destination. And so we spent a lot of time going up to the ice cap. Uh, it was w within walking distance of our base. We could go up to the face of that uh, huge ice cap that, that they had. It, it was a, uh, an enormous uh, glacier. And uh, when we got to the to the face of it, it seemed like you looked up about a thousand feet, and we had a lot of fun messing around. But then uh, uh, we were on our way to uh, Iceland, which was our next stop. And uh, when we got to Iceland, we were also uh, weathered in for a few days until we went on to to uh, Great Britain. So. Uh, well, what we had always done before was leave leave one of the crew on the plane at night, just so no no nothing could happen to it. Well, when they got there, the uh, uh, head of the uh, they had an MP but uh, a company there that did nothing but guard the airplanes, and he said, "You guys don't need it need to leave anybody on the plane because." Uh, we'll, we'll take good care of it. We said, okay, that's good. That meant somebody didn't have to spend the night on the plane. And after three days, well, we got back in there. But before we left the States, almost everybody on the crew bought a case of whiskey to take over bourbon because you couldn't get bourbon in, in, the, uh, in the European theater. And uh, they said, be sure and get, take a case of bourbon over there because if you don't drink it, you can sell it for a big price. So everybody, I think, had, had a case of bourbon. Well, when we got back on the plane to take off, our bourbon was all gone. Those MPs had stolen all of our, all of our whiskey, except I think we had two cases that we'd stuck down in the ball turret. All the rest of them were in the Bombay and they got all the ones in the Bombay. We had two cases left to split among ourselves when we got over there. The Icelandic uh, population is entirely Danish. They're all Danes. And, uh, and Iceland is a fairly, you know, has always been a fairly isolated uh, island out in, in the middle of the North Atlantic. And so basically, through, through the years, they have had noticed that they had a high rate of uh, inbreeding because when you've got a, a 
bunch of people on the same island all the time around each other. You get to where you don't know whether you're marrying a cousin or son or not. So the 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 directors or the whoever the, was running the country decided that they needed to do something about that. And since they had this uh, American Air Force base there, uh, they had a chance to in, in introduce new blood. So they, they started what they call trial marriages. So a, a guy from, from the base there could go into town, meet a pretty girl, and the girls were all involved in this too. I mean, they were uh, anxious to be part of the program. And so you'd go in there and uh, get a date with a girl, and then if you, if you liked each other, go down to the courthouse or whatever their equivalent was and uh, sign up for a six-month trial marriage. And uh, the idea was to get the girl pregnant. And when, when that happened, when she got pregnant, they'd go down and cancel the trial, the trial marriage, and if they wanted, do another one. So I was, I got all this information from one of the guys, the permanent guys that were stationed there, and I said, man, oh man, I said, uh, that's, that's pretty good duty, isn't it? And he said, you bet. And I said, what would you do if they transferred you out of here? And he said, I'd slit my wrists. But anyway, that was a little, little known fact about Iceland during the war. We left Iceland and landed at a certain place uh, in Great Britain. I don't remember exactly where it was. And dropped that uh, brand new airplane off. And uh, and this at this base is where they would add all the armament. They'd put all the uh, 50 caliber machine guns in it and everything to get it to get it ready for combat. And then they sent us uh, to our what was to be our permanent base uh, in uh, a little town called Thurlai, which is just out. Uh, almost a suburb of uh, Bedford, England, which is about 50 miles or so north of London. And that was our permanent base and uh, in introduced us to the, to the world of, uh, of combat. When we first got there, the protocol was to go in, uh, the, the officers on the crew go in and report in to the commanding officer. And then he assigned you uh, your, or, or he has someone assign you your living quarters and everything, and the enlisted men are getting the same thing from somebody else. So we we found out where we we're going to be sleeping and everything, and, and the CO said, "Now uh, at three o'clock, I want you all to be down on the flight line, and the officer of the day there will will be there, and, and our crew is on a mission. Our our group is on a mission right now." And they'll be coming in about 3.30. So uh, we all went down there waiting to watch our group come in. And the, the uh, OD, uh, officer of the day, uh, started telling us a little bit about the landing procedure. And the landing procedure uh, consisted of uh, uh, taking care of somebody who really had to land out of their normal landing pattern uh, b uh, because uh, they may have all kinds of things happen. So he said what they do is if they have wounded on board, they, they fire a, a red-red flare. Each flare gun had two colors in it, or, or it could be the same color, but there are two flares. And if, they, if you see a red-red flare, you wave them on in because that means they have wounded on board. By the same token, if 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 uh, they shoot a, a say a, I don't remember the exact colors, but say a red or green flare, uh, that means that they've got engine trouble. Maybe maybe an engine or two is out, uh, or they've got some kind of a mechanical problem where they really need to get on the ground. We wave them on in, and then the third thing was uh, if they fire a green green flare, that means they're low on gasoline and really need to, to uh, get on the ground. But hell, all of them are low on gasoline, so we'll pay attention to that.
while we were waiting for them to for their new group to get in and and uh, we watched all the landing procedure and everything uh, they they landed and jeeps would go out and pick up the crews and and bring them in for their debriefing and when we saw those guys after a nine-hour mission they they were exhausted both from the from the uh, physical att attributes, but also just the being so keyed up for so long. And uh, we saw these guys, and I mean, there wasn't a smile on anybody's face. They were happy, happy to be home, <clears throat> but they were just w used up. And I turned to Nelly, my co-pilot, and I said, you know, Nelly, I, don't, I ain't sure this is going to be all that fun. And he said, I don't either. So that was our first first reaction to seeing these guys climbing out of that airplane and going in. They continue with your training when you get there. You, you're assigned an airplane, but they want you to get used to that particular airplane and the armament and everything that's on there. And uh, we, we flew several. Uh, uh, missions where uh, the, the, it was gunnery practice, and uh, there would be a tow plane with a with a with a tow target behind it, and uh, all of the gunners would would take shots at that tow tow target, and uh, we flew uh, navigation missions, uh, t testing uh, the different ways that you can get you could navigate mostly you you could if you could see the ground uh, all of the forests uh, in in England had a certain shape to them and they had they had maps that that had not only the towns on it but the shape of of the uh, forests and they usually they, they weren't very big but they all had a definite shape so you could navigate across England by just going from one forest to another because you could see the exact shape that's on your map. They also had what they call buncher beacons. A buncher beacon was a beacon with, was a very, with a very short range and it was used mostly for, uh, for, uh, for, a, group, <clears throat> for a group to uh, uh, form form into their form, formation after after they take off from their base you fly to a certain buncher beacon and then you fly around and and f form your formation uh, the different squadrons there are three squadrons in a group and each squadron has a leader so you'd form up on your group on your squadron leader and then the two squadrons would the the lead squadron they would form their squadron in there so so you'd end up with 36 airplanes in a certain pattern. And then that's when we head, we'd head over toward Germany or whatever our target was. The other training missions we had, they weren't exactly training, but they were getting us used to flying uh, uh, combat airplanes uh, were what they call slow timing. Slow timing meant that uh, they'd, they'd put they had a stock of new engines because it wasn't, you know, uh, you can, uh, an engine can get shot out, shot up where it's no longer useful or it can just wear out. And uh, they didn't want an airplane to be sitting on the ground just because they didn't have a replacement. So they had plenty of replacement engines and so they'd replace that, in, that old engine with, an, with a new one. But before they could put it to work in combat, it had to be slow timed. And that means you flew it around, not, not at high speeds, but you flew it around so it'd get a time where, you know, the pistons and everything were oiled and, and, and they, they, they'd get to a certain point where they, they say, well, it's ready to fly now. And, and, uh, but it, it takes about a three or four hour slow time uh, flight to get that engine in shape. So what was slow time and gunnery missions and navigation missions, we flew, flew 
quite a few missions before we, our first combat mission. First combat mission was a real eye opener. Uh, we had been told what to expect, and we thought we knew what to expect, but uh, it, it, uh, it was a revelation in many ways to the different guys on the, on the plane. I remember uh, one thing was when we got close to our target, we looked up in front of us, and, our, and there was just thousands of these uh, smoke trails. Well, I knew what they were, but uh, mostly the enlisted men on the crew had never, hadn't been told about them, and, so, and they didn't know what they were, and they thought it was flak, and it was just a solid wall of that stuff. And one of them called and said, "God, damn, we're not going to go through with that, are we?" And I said, "Don't worry about it. That's just smoke trails from the bombs." Well, when uh, when you when you dropped your bombs, it left a, a smoke trail behind it. That was to help help follow it down so you could see where it uh, where it landed and and, and uh, uh, if how near you were to hitting your target. Uh, the night before, they would post uh, which which uh, crews were going on the mission because we had enough we had enough uh, crews and airplanes above the 36 that we put in the air uh, that would get some rest. Both the airplane would get some rest and so would the crews. Once you knew that you were going to fly the next day, uh, you started getting yourself prepared for that. And, uh, and when you went to bed at night, it was hard to go to sleep without just uh, sitting there thinking about what's it going to be like tomorrow. And, where are we going and all that kind of stuff. It was hard to get to sleep at night. I was in the Kwanzaa hut with, with the pilot and co-pilot, and they'd come in and wake us up, and we'd get going. But a lot of times, uh, the, the ground crews would run the engines up on all the planes just to get them warmed up, and there were 36 of them, each one of them, each one of them with four engines cranking up, and they're, they're just right outside our windows, and uh, you couldn't sleep when they when they started revving them up. They always had a, a big breakfast because you know you were going to be gone a long time, and uh, uh, the only problem was the only eggs they had were were. Uh, dried uh, egg substitutes that didn't taste anything like eggs and nobody wanted to eat them. But fortunately there was a, a, a farm a person uh, that lived just within bicycle distance of our base that had a bunch of chickens and he uh, had always had eggs. So he'd come around to the to the, to the base almost every day with a big thing of eggs and you could buy a couple of eggs from him, from him. and then at, at breakfast they had a fry cook standing there and he'd cook your two eggs for you and then you, you'd have eggs and all the other stuff so but anyway that's it started off with with breakfast then you went to the briefing and if if, if you've ever seen the movie 12 o'clock high it, you, you, you see what a, a briefing is pretty much like it was in that movie. Uh, the com usually the commanding uh, group commander is up there on a platform with a, a screen behind him and a map, and they roll that curtain away from that screen, and that's the first time you know what your target is. And then he describes the route you take and uh, some of the details about, uh, about what to expect on the on the thing. The last thing that happens is they, they hack, the, hack your watches. And that means they set the watches so that everybody's on the same time. So the way they do that is uh, uh, they tell you to set your watch uh, at a certain time, say, let's say 5.30. And, uh, and, and, and you, 
you have yours set and, and the way a hack watch works is when you punch that it'll start running so all, all of us have our hack watch set at 530 but it's actually uh, say two or three minutes before that and the and the guy doing the hack uh, goes counts down the seconds until you get that 530 and then he says hack and everybody hacks it at the same time and so that that way every buddy on on the cruise and and in the lead and everybody else has exactly the same time so that way when they're saying you're going to do something so in a certain time everybody will reach that at the same time uh, then the, the next thing is uh, you have individual uh, briefings on your what your specialty is and I, I of course always went to the navigators briefing and that's when when we learn all about you know, wh what headings we're going to use and what altitude we need to be at certain points and uh, uh, what what wind direction they anticipate and everything but actually <coughs> uh, unless you were the lead navigator you didn't have have much all you were doing was following the lead but they managed to think up all kinds of things for a navigator to do when he's not navigating one of my specific jobs was to issue everybody a 45 automatic uh, they they didn't issue those to us uh, uh, to where we wore them all the time only on a mission so I was the one that had to, I had to go check out the the uh, a box full of those 45 automatics and then I'd uh, issue one to each each crew member and several clips of ammunition when the mission was over then they had him had to check them back into me one of the uh, jobs that uh, that I had they didn't always have the navigator do, do this sometimes they had the radio man do it but somebody had to go back into the bomb bay and and arm all of the bombs and that was my job I, I, I did that on almost every mission and uh, and the, the thing that made it difficult for one thing is uh, it was it was like 30 degrees below zero and uh, and uh, and you had naturally you uh, we were 25,000 feet so you had to have oxygen so you had an oxygen mask and uh, so I and, and, and it's plugged into a to the main source of oxygen but then you unplug it and take a walk around bottle and it, it was a, a plastic bottle about oh two quarts maybe uh, of, with oxygen in it and then you plug it into that well that thing has about 10, 10 or 12 minutes of, of oxygen and sometimes when it gets real close uh, I'd run over to the to the uh, radio room and run in and and uh, he had an extra walk around bottle and and trade out and and get another walk around bottle to, to finish my job so uh, that was always you know the walk the walkway down the bomb bay was only about this wide and it had these uh, structural things like this which you hung on to but and sometimes the bomb bays were open when I was doing that from uh, takeoff the first thing we did was fly to some point uh, to form the, the group and it's all done on a very strict timetable because uh, we're not the only group going to this target there may be there may be 20 groups going to that same target and you can't have them all dropping bombs at the same time everybody has their time schedule that they have to be on and uh, it, it really messes things up if somebody's not where they should be at, at that time I remember one specific mission where uh, we were coming from the west and there was a, a, a group from 
that was stationed in Italy uh, going to the same target. And when I was, uh, when, when we were right on our, on our bomb run from, from the initial point, the IP to the, to the target, we, I was getting, we were getting ready to open our bomb bays and I looked out the Astrodome. Astrodome is a, a little bubble on the top of the airplane where you can see out. It's primarily uh, to use for celestial navigation. But uh, uh, I, I got up and, and looked, looked to look around and I looked up and here was a, a group of B-24s right above us. Couldn't have been 500 feet above us and all of their bomb bays were open. And I'm looking up at all these uh, bombs in that bomb bay and saying, please God, don't let them drop now. And then, so they just went over us like that. And, and then, then they dropped. Rarely did, did a navigator have to do anything over there when you were following the lead. But the times that you did have to work was coming back home because you didn't stay in the same formation all the time. Sometimes the weather was such that you had to break up into single ships because uh, you couldn't fly right through a big cloud in, with a tight formation. And so uh, we had a real primitive radar thing that I've had, I think I've had two checkouts on it. The screen on it was about as big as a grapefruit. It had a line at the bottom and a, and a blip and the, and that blip was, was the, uh, the, the base that, that you were going to. And this other blip was the airplane. And so you had to, you had to get yourself lined up with the runway out far enough to where, or, or, and close enough to where you, that blip, you could see the, the, the blip, the air base blip. And I'd only had two checkouts on it. I was scared to death and it was socked in. So the, the, the ceiling was about 100 feet and uh, it was just solid clouds. And anyway, I got where I thought was where I needed to be and I started watching that blip. And I, I said, Willie, lay down on your belly and, and, and look down because you're gonna have to tell me if you, what, as soon as you can see anything. So we're going along there and that blip's getting closer and closer and I'm telling the pilot what altitude he needs to be at, at certain times. And, uh, and then finally, uh, uh, I, 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 I told the pilot when to drop his gear, his, his landing gear. And then, then I'm just watching those blips come together, just hoping like hell we're in the right spot. And just as they came together, uh, Willie called to me and I went up there and the, the, num the numbers on the end of the runway were just going underneath the plane. And, uh, and we touched down. And that was, that was the first time I ever got an ovation <laughs> from the crew. Uh, the commanding general, uh, when we got there, was Jimmy Doolittle. Uh, he, general Doolittle was famous for the raid they made on Tokyo, where they took, uh, B-25s took off from a carrier and, uh, and flew in and, and uh, bombed Tokyo and then went to China and landed. Uh, a lot of them were, didn't make it, but it was really an incredible feat since only 140 days before that uh, was Pearl Harbor, which kicked off the war against Japan. So uh, Doolittle was a famous person when he came to that group, or to the 8th Air Force. And uh, General Eisenhower had just been made the Supreme Commander, and he, he, he fired uh, Ira Eaker from the 8th Air Force. Ira Eaker uh, was a great uh, leader and a great general, but he had a different concept. 
his concept was give the crew some rest and give the airplane some rest. He felt like that if the crews are too tired, they're not going to operate efficiently. And the airplanes, they get tired too if they don't get some rest. Eisenhower told Doolittle, I want to get this war over with. And the way we're going to do it is we're going to have those airplanes in the air all the time. So Doolittle came around to each, each group commander and put the word in their ear, uh, you get those planes fixed and you get those crews ready because we're going to do a lot of flying. And as it turns out, I, I, I can't remember the exact number, but uh, I flew 22 missions in about 31 days. And so that meant there were many, many of those uh, missions that were after two, two and three days at a time. And uh, I can tell you that after three missions in three days, you're ready for to spend another day in bed. The targets were really all over. Berlin was a favorite target, and then also Oranienburg, which is only like a suburb of Berlin. But there were others too. Earlier in the war, uh, all of our strategic bombing was concentrating on factories, things like that. One was a ball bearing factory in Swineford, and they figured if they can put them out of ball bearings, uh, they won't be able to run their tanks. By the time we got over there, they had shifted their their uh, emphasis on travel. They wanted to inhibit or prevent them to have the free use of all their railroads. Most of our missions had to do with what they call marshalling yards. And that's, that's what we bombed a lot. So uh, some of the places we bombed weren't anywhere near Berlin, but they were, they had something to do with transportation. So we, we bombed Dresden, close to uh, Leipzig, some major cities, but always uh, it, was the, it was the marshalling yards that, that we were bombing. And they protected those. They knew what we were, what our targets were, and so they'd always have flak waiting for us. Uh, and we're, somehow, they always seemed to know where we were going. One Berlin raid. This was our third mission, and we we weren't all that seasoned yet. I was reading the uh, mission report on on that particular raid, and and the the question was asked in briefing. Uh, how much flak damage did your group have? And it ended up that 33 out of the 36 planes had flak damage. On that same mission, we saw the group in front of us get attacked by two ME-262s. And ME-262, that's Messerschmitt 262, was the uh, jet airplane that they developed. We had never seen a plane without a prop. So it was really a, a revelation to see how fast they were, for one thing, and how deadly they were because uh, they carried uh, the, their armament was a 20 millimeter cannon instead of the 50 caliber machine guns that we were using. So we saw these two ME-262s attacking the group in front of us, and then one of them uh, took a run at our group. Uh, uh, but uh, he didn't. He didn't hit anybody. And then on that same mission, uh, an ME-109, which was their standard fighter plane, attacked us. So that that was an exciting mission. We even had one one flight where we flew over to France. There there was a a little coastal installation in northern France uh, that was still occupied by the Germans. So we. I think we were getting. I think the ground troops were getting ready to take that over, but they wanted to soften up, up some. So, so we we bombed uh, a mission in France, and that didn't take very long at all. You know, four hours uh, or two two and a half hours to get there, and two and a half one, one, one long mission. And another mission we had was to Kiel, uh, Germany, which is up on the north coast. And they had a big uh, submarine uh, uh, 
we call them submarine bins, but it was it was like a big tunnel, and where they kept all their su submarines, and uh, we had heard that that we had developed a, a huge bomb where where a B-17 could only carry one of them that would go through all the uh, concrete and stuff they had protecting that submarine bin. But, uh, so we were really excited about going out to the airplane and seeing what we were carrying, but we didn't have anything like that. We just had the regular, I think we had 12 500 pound bombs. We had one trip to uh, Dresden, which was amazing because we were bombing a, a marshalling yard with regular bombs, but the 8th Air Force had attacked Dresden about a month before this, where they dropped incendiaries and frags, uh, fragmentation bombs. And the main thing they were doing was destroying Dresden and killing as many people as they could. And they wanted to, they wanted to break their spirit. They wanted to say, you better end this war or this is what you're going to get. So we were all scared to death to go back to Dresden because if you'd have had to bail out anywhere near Dresden, you were dead meat. The one, one thing that they always emphasized, all the, all the old veterans told us, if you get shot up and have to know you're going to have to bail out, get as far away from that target as you can because the people that live around that target are going to be mad. And uh, the farther away you get from the target, the more likely you'll survive. Probably the one that affected me the most was a trip to Oranienburg, which was just out of Berlin. They had it uh, covered pretty well with flak. And uh, I learned something in that mission because we were in a very tight formation and the, the plane next to us and slightly uh, slightly above and sli slightly ahead of us where I, I could just look out my window and, and see the tail gunner. And he, somehow we just happened to both be looking at each other at the same time. We, we locked eyes and then I, I kind of waved at him and he waved to me. And probably three minutes later, they took a direct hit. I'm gonna have to settle down a little bit. Sorry. For some reason, it's hard not to get emotional. About three minutes later, uh, they took a direct hit in the tail, and the entire tail assembly separated from the main airplane. And he came out separate from that, and I could see him tumbling over and over. And I watched him as long as I could to see if a chute came out, but it never, never did, so I'm sure he was dead by then. But uh, that, that taught me I would never make eye contact, contact again with, with, a, with a, anybody in a close by airplane. It was, just, it, it was a jinx or a bad luck or something, but I wasn't ever going to do that again. One time when we were t returning from a mission, we weren't too far from the target. Uh, we were still in a fairly tight formation. If you got far enough away, then you could loosen it up and didn't have to fly right on each other's tail. But at this time, we still had pretty tight formation. And we looked out on, on, my, on my side of the plane. Uh, we could see a, a stripped-down B-17 flying right along, even with us. He was out there uh, a couple thousand yards, maybe. And uh, everybody started getting nervous about it. What? Who is that guy? What are they doing? 
we thought it might be a German recon uh, situation or what. And so all the gunners had their guns swung, swung all their guns around on onto that. And then finally somebody got on, and, and you never talk between airplanes. But this time, the uh, group leader says, get those goddamn guns off of that plane. That's, that's right. Doolittle. <laughs> and, and Doolittle was, was flying there to see if we were still in a tight formation. He hated, he'd hate it if you, let, you know, eased up too much. So he'd fly, he'd fly out there himself and, and he'd get by, by our group and then go to another group and everything. Swinder didn't get shot down by somebody that didn't know who he was. <laughs> when we returned from a mission, uh, first thing they did was you, you, got, you got your place in line for, for, uh, for landing and, and whatever that position was. When you were on the ground, uh, you uh, got in, the, in a jeep and went in there and the, uh, the, the intelligent people were ready there to interview each crew. And the first thing they did was give you a shot of whiskey. Or if they didn't have whiskey, it would be cognac or brandy or something. But anyway, it, it was a pretty good a little paper cup full of, full of, and that would, that would really calm you down because we'd be hyped up, you know, and, and uh, that, that, that really loosened you up. And they wanted you loose so that, so they get all the information from you they could. Uh, we were all observers. Uh, everybody was f responsible for whatever their position in the airplane was to report what they saw on the ground. Sometimes it was interesting stuff, sometimes it was dull. But they wanted to know everything. You had a fairly long interview session. Then you'd go to the mess hall and eat a big meal. I don't remember the destination of our final mission to be on that map, but uh, it was in in late April, and uh, uh, we knew the war was getting close to being over. With. And and when when we flew our last mission, I think we were told that this probably was the last mission. We were, and the whole group was told that this is probably your last mission, and. Uh, and then in, on May the 7th is when uh, Germany surrendered and uh, it was called VE Day, Victory in Europe Day. And uh, uh, so uh, right after VE Day, Jimmy Doolittle uh, sent word out to all the groups that they were confined to the base. At least, I think he said three days. And uh, the reason he did that was he, he said, I want to let the Brits celebrate without any interference from us. After that, we all headed for London. And I remember very distinctly that night, I was in Piccadilly Circus, which is the kind of the theater and entertainment center of London. And uh, you have never seen a celebration like that. Guys were hanging from lamp posts with a bottle of whiskey in one hand and hanging on with the other. And uh, they were marching up and down the streets, arm in arm, singing. And in order to get across the street from here to there, you'd get swept down a couple of blocks before you could get all the way across the street. It was one heck of a celebration. I'll never forget. The first thing all of us thought Thank God I'm not the last guy to get killed in this war. Because <laughs> every mission you flew, I don't want to be the last guy killed in this war. And uh, so I, I think relief probably is, is the main uh, emotion we had. Uh, all the other guys in my crew uh, stayed in, in, the, in England for, for longer. And they, and they started uh, doing photo mapping. And they did a lot of photo, photo mapping both in, in uh, all over Europe and in North Africa. And so uh, they, they were still working while 
and that, but they, they flew me home right away because they were short of navigators in the Pacific. And they sent me to Ellington Field in, uh, in Houston to begin training to be a navigator on a B-29 uh, and, and head for the Pacific. But in the meantime, when I got home, uh, for, for one thing, I had grown a mustache. It was the scroungiest looking thing you can imagine. I was only 19 years old, and, and uh, it was pretty scroungy looking. But I wanted to show it to my mom. I was able to go home for, for 10 days before I reported in down in Houston. But anyway, I was going to show mom that mustache. But by then, it was really getting hot. And of course, there wasn't any air conditioning on those trains or anything like that. And that darn thing started itching so bad. It was driving me nuts. I finally shaved it off before I got home. I just couldn't stand that itching anymore. When I got to Houston, I'm crazy about uh, uh, raw oysters. I went to the oyster bar down in downtown Houston. It was about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and, and there was no one else in there. And it was just one guy. And I said, start shucking oysters, and I'll tell you when to quit. And he'd, he'd shuck it, and I'd eat it. And I had a, of course, I had a beer or two. And they had already cut my orders, but it, they hadn't sent me yet. And that's when uh, the, the bomb was dropped on Hiroshima. And then a couple of days later, a few days later, uh, the Japanese surrendered. So it was called VJ Day, Victory Over Japan. And uh, so they canceled my orders to go to the Pacific then. I elected to... Uh, stay in the reserve like my dad did. Uh, so uh, I had a little different separation than the other guys. The guys who got discharged, they were discharged and they had no further uh, duties uh, with the country. But I, uh, for, for the next 30 years, uh, I was on call. I mean, I was, they could have called me back in and on any of those other wars. And, and I, I was particularly apprehensive about having to go to Korea. And I was in two or three reserve units, and each one of them had uh, at least one other navigator in the, in the unit besides me. And in both of them, they took one of those navigators and sent him to, to uh, Korea. And the only reason I can think of that they chose him over me was because he had not been in com neither one of those other guys had been in combat before and I think possibly they thought you know if they had a choice they'd take a guy that had never been to combat when we got back to school it was amazing first of all a guy named Dean Parlin was the Dean of Student Life and he kind of had control over all of the things having to do with the students and, and, and their grades. And uh, a lot of us, right before we went into the war, had a bad semester because we partied a lot and didn't worry too much about grades because we knew we were going, in a, going to war. So a bunch of us had real bad uh, grade averages on the, on the last semester that they were in school. But Dean Parlin, uh, if you were a veteran, he wiped your sl slate clean, and uh, he let you go back in school and start as if you as if you weren't on scholastic probation. We were on the quarter system at, at the University of Texas that time, and one of the quarters was just get beginning to open, uh, like like uh, October the fifteenth or something like that. And so a, a bunch of us wanted to get back in time to, to get in that fourth quarter, uh, the, the thing is we didn't all get there the same day. I mean, there one group would be there one day and then the next day some other guys would get there. Well, we had to have a party every time somebody new came along. For the first six weeks or so after we all got back, we just couldn't talk enough about the war 
what we'd, what we'd done, but we wanted to know what everybody else had done. We had guys at the Marine Corps that had made landings in, in the Pacific and, and, and Navy guys who had been on uh, cruisers and, and uh, uh, destroyers and had a lot of combat experience, in, in the, mostly in the Pacific. And then a whole bunch of us were, had been in the 8th Air Force in England. Everybody just wanted to know what, what everybody else had done. And, and, uh, but after about six weeks, we'd, we'd done all that. We had, everybody knew what you did and you knew what everybody else had done. So we didn't talk about it anymore. And the way it turned out, and for most of them, I'm sure this is true, we didn't talk about it again for 40 years or so. Usually until your kids got old enough to want to really know something about what you did, you know. But we were so busy just getting back to finishing school and getting a job and uh, getting married and having families, we didn't think about the war. In my senior year, I met Jane Switzer. She uh, was at a party that the, my fraternity, the Phi Gamma Delta fraternity, uh, we were having a party. It was out at our lake house. And I was one of the guys, a lot of the veterans uh, uh, were on GI Bill and didn't have much money. So we worked uh, uh, at this lake house. Uh, several of us were always out there cooking hamburgers and waiting tables and stuff like that. And so we got paid a little bit for doing that. And I had, I had been on that duty this particular day and everybody had been up in the, in the, in the main building having uh, snacks and beer and stuff. And then, but after that, they all went down to the lake and they were fooling around swimming. We had a dock going out in the lake and they were swimming and boating and everything. And I was up in, basically by myself up, up in, the, in the room with a bottle of beer, cutting cards with one hand. One of the, one of the waiters in our, in our fraternity uh, was a card shark and taught us all these tricks. From, and one of them was cutting them. So I was practicing doing that. And Jane walked up out of nowhere and she said, you're an awful somber looking guy. I didn't know exactly how to respond to that, but when I looked up and saw her, I said, I gotta know this girl. <laughs> so we finally figured out a time when I could have a date with her. She, she was booked up for, seemed like weeks ahead of time, but uh, uh, we, uh, we had our first date, and then after that, I don't think either one of us had another date with anybody else. But in 1950, we, in June of 1950, we got married and been married, it's been married 58 years now. She was incredibly beautiful. Still is. We've had a wonderful life together. My degree was in geology and with an with a emphasis on petroleum geology. They had, they had two ways you could go in the geology school. You could go soft rock, which, which meant you were looking for oil in, in uh, sedimentary rocks and things like that, or hard rock, where you were talking about mining. And, uh, but most of the guys in, 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 in the University of Texas were, were soft rock geologists and interested in the petroleum industry. If you went to Colorado School of, school of Mines or something like that, you got the same geology degree, but it was emphasizing hard rock or mining. So uh, that's uh, that's why I was in the oil business. Besides that, my dad had always been in the oil business, so so it just was kind of natural. In fact, I was third generation oil business, and uh, uh, so the. And the first place I got a job was in Midland. So I took Jane to Midland and she thought she'd go into the end of the earth because she was born and raised in Beaumont where they have big pine trees and everything. We had nothing but scrub, scrub oak and, and, uh, and uh, China, uh, 
Russian thistle, which was tumbleweeds. Uh, she thought she'd gotten to the end of the earth when we got out there, but she managed to stay out there 35 years with me. My first job out there was with a lo well logging crew. What that is, we'd have a trailer house uh, and, and sit out on a rig while, while a well was being drilled and uh, check all the samples and everything and, and, and just log the samples in a well and, and uh, for, for usually a major oil company. And uh, I've been doing that for well, maybe a year, maybe. I don't, I'm not sure how long, but uh, I, I was anxious to try to get a job with an oil company. And my, my preference was Gulf oil. Uh, I knew other guys that worked for Gulf, and, and I, know, I knew it was one of the best major oil companies you could, you could have. So it just so happened that my dad was close friends uh, with a guy named Kip Harper who was a, was a real pioneer in that uh, area. In fact, he, he discovered one of the biggest oil fields in the world uh, when he, and he had worked for Gulf. And, he, he, and so he was responsible for Gulf having many, many acres of, of uh, wells to drill uh, over the next 20 years or so. But, uh, but he was still in Midland, but he was, at that time, had, had long since uh, retired from Gulf. But he still had friends with Gulf. So I got an appointment with him. I, I had known him socially before. He and his wife had been over to our house for dinner and stuff like that. And, uh, but my dad called him asking if, he, asking him if, if he'd mind uh, me coming up and talking to him about the possibility of going to work for him. He said, sure, have him come by. So I went up there, and all he wanted to talk about was the war for a while. But when he got that over with, he said, well, I understand you'd like to go to work for golf. He said, "He said, uh, let me see if I can't help you. So he picked up the phone, called one of the vice presidents in, in, in golf, the one who uh, was in, in charge of all the geology, all the geologists, and said, I got this young man here, and if you've got a place for him, you really need to hire him. He's he's a good man. He says he's been in the war over in Europe and done all this stuff, and now he's now he's wanting to go, get on with his life, and and he'd like to go to work for golf, and I, I I'd like for him too, because he, he's I know his dad real well, and he he's a from a great family, and and he's a great man. And I stayed with him ten years. <laughs> I love this story. Can we tell it? Okay. After I'd been with Gulf for quite a while, I was still sitting on wells. And they had me down on a well near Fort Stockton, Texas, which is really out in the boondocks. And uh, it was a deep well, so I'd been there quite a while. And Jane was working for an oil company in Midland in the accounting department. Wasn't it? I guess I shouldn't be talking to her. <laughs> But uh, she was uh, working for an oil company in Midland. And uh, I'd, I'd try to get off and come in for a few hours and then go back. And she, I don't know if she ever came down to visit me because it was a long drive down there. But, uh, and there wasn't, wasn't any, it wasn't rigged up for a lady. Uh, we didn't have any facilities uh, when when you had to do use the bathroom or anything, you went around behind the reserve pit. It was out, outside. So I, I, I got to thinking, if we had something, I had a trailer house to live in, but there wasn't that, no, no indoor plumbing. So uh, I went up to the, to the superintendent one day or the driller or somebody. I said, is there any way you guys could build me a, a, a a latrine out here, a, 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 what do you call it, an outdoor bathroom, you know, where you dig a trench and all that, you know. So they said, sure, we'll do that. So they dug a big, deep trench and, and built this house around it. Hey, you had a little half moon on it. And uh, when they got that finished, I, I had Jane come down and, and visit. And, I, and that, So that way she could come down and spend the weekend with me. 
I left, left Gulf Oil in about 1961, and uh, a, another uh, friend of ours, who was a uh, petroleum engineer, he was a reservoir engineer, worked for uh, uh, a small oil company. And uh, he had gotten an offer from a friend of his, or a friend of a friend of his, offered him a job to open an office in Midland and, and, and work for a very small company and at more money. No other companies weren't paying all that big a salary. So he, he, uh, he said, I'll do it on one condition is that we have, have a geologist on board because I don't know how to find a prospect. I, I know what to do with the prospect after it's been found, but I don't know how to find prospects. So we, were, we, had a, uh, we were at a bridge party, I think, and, and all the families were together. And Joe was telling me about this, and he said, would you like to be considered for this job? And I said, sure. So the guy wanted wanted at least three, three applicants to interview, and he interviewed me and two other guys and offered me the job, and I took it. So Joe and I <coughs> uh, became basically partners in opening an office for this small oil company in Midland. And I guess that lasted a year or so, and then he got in financial trouble and had to close that office. So Joe and I uh, both were out of work and we decided uh, well are we going to try to I think both of us could have gotten jobs back uh, if we'd wanted to but we decided to try it on our own and, and go independent so we became an independent partnership and uh, we uh, we started off by renting, renting a little office a little uh, room in an office building and uh, then we went to the bank to open a bank account with with our, uh, our new part, our new company name. We got there and we talked to one of the vice presidents and said we want we're we're starting a new par partnership and want to open a bank account. And he said oh, that's that's great. We're glad to have you. He said, uh, and he said how much we'd have to put in the account to start with and everything. And he said. What's the name of your outfit going to be? We hadn't thought of that. So we flipped a coin to see whose name would be first, whether it would be Parker and Parsley or, Par or Parsley and Parker. I won the toss, so we named the company Parker and Parsley. And uh, we were together 25 years. Built this building, that company up over 25 year period. And then in 1985, we... Uh, sold the company and retired. You know, nowadays, when a kid's 18 years old, he's still running and playing, not even thinking about the future. But when you spend uh, some of your, the years you ought to be having a lot of fun in the Army, in the service, you grow up. You become an adult. And, and that's why it, I think Jane was attracted to me because uh, I, I was uh, I was older, but I was also more mature than than the ones who had never been in the service. Those stories get better every time I hear them, and you did a real good job. I think this was maybe one hundred millionth time or something <laughs> or another. Probably. And I love you very much. I love you too. You think the kids will enjoy it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Right. Again, this couldn't happen again. This is at once in a lifetime. This is a thrill divine. What's more, this never happened. such as you would suddenly be mine, mine to hold as I'm holding you now, and yet never so near, mine to have when the now and the here disappear, what matters dear? 
this doesn't happen again, we'll have this moment forever, but never, never. This doesn't happen again.